continuing our series, Walking in Power. If you're new around here, uh, we do expository preaching where we go verse by verse through a book of the Bible, and we've been in the book of Acts since uh, August of 2022. And, uh, and so we are uh, just only on chapter 16, and, uh, and man, we just it's been moving, and God's been moving through this series, and so we're going to dive in today into where we're at in, in Acts chapter 16. To give you a little context of where we just left off at, um, Acts chapter 15, we saw the sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. They split paths. They wanted to go back and visit all the churches they had established. So instead of going together, they split, and, and uh, Paul and Barnabas went. Uh, I mean, Paul and Silas went one way, while Barnabas and John Mark went the other. And while they were on that journey, while Paul and them were on that journey, they show up in Lystra and they pick up Timothy. And that's where we learned how to be spirit-led influencers, right? Um, and so you can ch- catch all these sermons back on the website, by the way. And then in Acts chapter 16, we also looked at. When God says no, nobody likes it when you get told no, right? And so we got to see what happens when God says no, as he told Paul and Barnabas, no, you're not going to go preach the gospel back to these churches you established, and no, you're not going to go into Bithynia. Um, Oh, yeah, you got the map right here. You can kind of see it. So they went that way, right? I'm going to bring this up in a moment again, but you can see the two no's right there because they thought that's what they were going to do. That didn't happen, and they kept walking. And so today what we're doing is we left off where they ended up in Troas, and, and as they're there, Paul gets a, a vision to go to Macedonia. Uh, we're going to be in verses 11 through 19 today. I'm going to spend majority of the time, though, in verses 16 through 19. So we're going to go through verses 11 to 15 pretty quickly. Two stories of life change that we're going to look at. If you're, t- if you're taking notes, which I hope that you are, you can title today's message, Delivered and Set Free. Delivered and Set Free. Can we pray together? Lord, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for what you're already doing in this room. Lord, I pray that you open up our hearts to everything that you have to be said today. Lord, I pray that you would empower us and encourage us, refresh us and renew us, challenge us and convict us. Help us grow closer to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at two different stories of life change. The first story of life change sets up the second story of life change that we're going to look at. And what's interesting is the first story of life change becomes the provision for the second story of life change that actually happens. It's really cool because, you know, when God calls you to do something new and to venture into the unknown, oftentimes you you got to understand that he is a faithful God and he will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. So you might be walking into the unknown, but Lord, I'm going to tell you right now, if you let the Lord order your steps, he will provide for you even when things don't seem like they make sense. And we're going to see that right here today. And so let's start out. We're going to go in verse 11. Acts chapter 16, it says this. So setting sail from Troas, this Paul and his ministry team, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. For we remained in this city for some days. And so right here, we kind of get the context of what's going on, right, and, and where they're headed. And just to give you a little bit more of that context, you can bring that map up again. So remember, we don't have this part of the map on the screen, but Paul and his team, they were going to go the opposite way they did from the first missionary journey, and they were going to kind of travel up this way and do a big circle and come back around. But they end up not doing that because of the sharp disagreement with Barnabas. So they go this way. They come to Lystra. This is where they pick up Timothy. And you know the letters, First and Second Timothy, uh, that Paul writes to. So they pick Timothy up in Lystra. And as they start to go, they're going to go back to Asia Minor to go back to the churches they established on the first missionary trip. Remember, between the first and second missionary trip, there's probably about a five-year difference. So as they're going to go that way, the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not going to go back to these churches. Oh, wow. So they kept walking. And then they were like, hey, we're going to go to Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going to go to Bithynia. So I can only imagine there was a lot of confusion as they just kept, well, we'll just keep walking straight then. And eventually they end up in a town called Troas. This is actually where they pick up Luke, you know, the one who writes the gospel of Luke. And Luke is actually the one who writes the book of Acts. So it's the reason why we get these two books. And so Luke gets picked up and put on the ministry team right here. And while they're in Troas, Um, Paul has a vision, and in this vision, somebody from Macedonian is calling for help. 
And so Paul concluded that the vision was to get him, was for them to go to new territory because at this time, the gospel has not been preached in this area. Nobody knows about Jesus out here. So they're going to new territory as they're going to sail across here. And what's interesting is the route that they took because they could have went a couple different directions to get where they wanted to go to Macedonia. However, they go to Samothrace first. And what's interesting is right here in this little area is what they consider a nautical expression which means that the wind of the sea would have been at their backs. They were able to travel 156 miles in two days. So they got there really quickly, right? They didn't have motors and stuff back in that time. But we know that on the way back, it took like five days for them to get back to fight the wind that they were going up against. So they get to Samoth Race, and then they go over here to Neapolis, until eventually they land in Philippi, which is a leading city, a bigger metro- metropolitan kind of area than the other areas they were at, and which makes sense for why Paul and them landed there instead of some of the other towns, the smaller towns, because it makes sense that Paul would have understood that the gospel would have been easier to spread from these cities instead of to these cities. And so he's going to go to the larger populated area, start establishing something before they start to scatter in around different parts of Macedonia. And so that's where they're at. They're in Philippi. Also, Philippi is known for being a Roman colony. Um, It says that the place where the armies, well, not the Bible, but I did some research and it says the place where the armies of Mark Antony and Octavian defeated Brutus and Cassius in the decisive battle of the Second Roman Civil War in 42 BC. I tell you that because it gives us context to say that this area would have had a lot of retired Roman soldiers and they would have had, they'd have been very strong and proud of their Roman connection. And so Paul and his missionary team, they're going into brand new ground, y'all. They're walking into ground. Remember, Jews and Gentiles aren't supposed to mix, and they're walking into new ground. Nobody that's heard about the gospel yet, nobody that knows Jesus out there, and they are going to evangelize. Brings us to verse 13. It says this, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we were supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and we spoke to the woman who had come together. Leave this up for me. So in other words, they get to Philippi, and on the Sabbath day, they are trying to find the synagogue. Now remember, this is Paul's evangelism strategy. As we've been looking at the book of Acts, anytime he goes into a new town, you know where he always went first? The synagogue. Why? Because they would have known the God of Israel, and it would have been much easier to talk to them about Jesus the Messiah, telling them that the Messiah had come. So his evangelism strategy would be different than ours today. We're not going to go up into a church and tell people about Jesus because people in church should know about Jesus, right? So we go to the streets today to evangelize the lost. It was opposite for Paul's time. Paul went straight to the synagogues to tell the Jews about Jesus. However, in Philippi, there is no synagogue. As he's looking around, there is no synagogue. Why? Well, it, What's interesting, it says that there should at least be 10 Jewish men in order to have a synagogue. And if you look at this, it says that they had to go outside the gate, outside the city gates to the riverside to try to find some Jewish people that were together. And they were there to what? They were there to pray. Because remember, Jews would pray at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. So they're there to pray. And so that means that there's no synagogue. There's probably less than 10 Jewish men there, but there could be some Jewish ladies, and they're going to meet one specific lady. Her name is Lydia. Look at your neighbor and say, Lydia. Her name is Lydia. And so what happens with Lydia? Verse 14, it says this. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So right here we get introduced to Lydia. And Lydia is going to become the provision for the ministry that's about to take place in Macedonia. And she's she's a Jew. She's out there. She's ready to pray. The Bible says that she's a seller of purple goods. This is interesting. Because purple goods was very expensive. The dye that was needed to create these purple goods was highly, highly expensive. Which means that she made a really good living for herself. And she was a very established and probably a very wealthy woman. But not just that she was a wealthy woman. She was a worshiper of God. She loved the God of Israel. 
And so as Paul goes and finds them outside the city gate, he begins to what? He begins to talk about Jesus to her. And it says that the Lord opened up her heart so that she could pay attention to what Jesus, what, what Paul said. In other words, she gave her heart to Jesus. So we see this life change through Jesus happen, and Lydia would be their first Europe convert. Uh, one thing that's interesting, too, is the city that she's from, Thyatira, uh, it's actually a, chur- a church gets established there, and it's one of the seven churches that is addressed in the book of Revelation. So, um, but that's just some side knowledge for you to know. So, but what I want you to notice about this story, because we're going to move on from this story pretty quickly, is two things. One, the pattern of life change that happens right here. Because we see this consistently through the book of Acts, that there is a pattern to life change and how it happens. But also how she becomes the provision so that the ministry in Macedonia could go on and other people could experience life change through Jesus. Now, when I'm talking about the pattern of life change, what are we talking about? There's three things that I see that happen right here, okay? The first thing is she opened up her heart and she gave her, her heart to Jesus, right? Can I tell you today, this is where it starts, y'all. It starts there. And there are a lot of unbelievers. There's a lot of people who don't know Jesus or believe in Jesus because they have closed hearts. They have hard hearts. Romans chapter 1 tells us that. They, that he basically says, look, I've just given them to their own desires because they have no, no want to even know the gospel. So I've just given them to their own desires for that, for that reason. And so the reality is there's a lot of people out there that they're just closed off. You know, they're closed off from God. And, and the thing is, you might be here at church today, and you might be closed off. Maybe you got dragged here because of a baby dedication, or maybe because a spouse wanted you to come, or maybe you're a single dude, and you're looking for a woman, and you just showed up trying to mingle, if you know what I mean. You know? You could have a closed heart and not really know the gospel at all. So the place that we start, listen, anytime you're going to, before you go evangelize, anytime before you share your faith with a friend, with a coworker, with a family member, anytime before you go and take this Easter invite card and bring it to somebody this week, can you do something for me? Can you pray, Lord, open the hearts of the people that I'm about to have a conversation with. Lord, stir in their hearts right now. Open their hearts. Did you notice what I did before, anytime, you, you, if you're here on Sundays, you know, every time before, right after I give you the title of the message and before I start preaching, I pray. And the first thing I always say is what? Lord, open up our hearts to what you have to be said today. Because one thing I know, you could have walked in this door today with a closed heart, but if there can be a little bitty crack in there, the gospel can get inside and begin to create life change through Jesus in you. I'm telling you, the Lord can do crazy things. He can do... Amazing thing. So the first thing we've got to do is in what we see in this pattern of life change is the Lord will open somebody's heart so they get to know, they come to know Jesus. The second thing we see is in verse 15. It says, and after she was baptized, right? Constantly in the book of Acts, they repent, were saved, and they were what? Water baptized. Okay? Listen, I'm not trying to knock another religion here. But baby baptism is not water baptism that we see in the Bible today. It's simply not. And there's too many people that tell me, I've even heard it a lot. You'd be crazy how many times I've heard this, where people look at me and say, ah, Pastor, I just, I got to pray about it first. I got to think about it, see if that's something I want to do. Can I tell you something? Baptism is not something you think about. Baptism is not something you pray about. Baptism is something you do out of the obedience that God has commanded you to do. Jesus himself was baptized at 30 years old. Multiple times through the Bible, we see what? Adults that were baptized by water submission. It's powerful when you get baptized, when you take that step of faith and obedience for the Lord. Because let me tell you something. Colossians tells us that when you baptize, two things are happening. You're making a public declaration of your faith, but you're identifying with Jesus as one through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. As you go down into the waters, as if you are dying to yourself, and leaving that self in the grave and being raised back to new life. All that to say is that if you're here today and you have not been water baptized, where you could cognitively make that decision yourself, you need to get baptized at Revival Nights. You need to sign up. 
immediately. There's nothing thinking about it. There's no praying about it. Get ready to get dunked. I love so much. My man over here, he said he got, he got saved the other day at our, at our, at our uh, baptism service. He said, I ain't waiting. He, I'm not waiting for a t-shirt. I'm not waiting to close. And he jumped up here behind the stage and got in the tank and we dunked him. That's how you do it right there. That's what it's supposed to look like. That's the book of, that was a book of Acts experience right there, man. I mean, the Lord can do some crazy things when, when you just walk in obedience to him. So we see this pattern of life change, right? She experienced salvation. She got publicly baptized. But the third thing she did, she activated her gift. Because look what it says. It says that in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us, which that just means that she convinced them to stay with her. So what was she doing? Did you know that there's a spiritual gift of giving? Okay, there's a spiritual gift of giving. The Lord had blessed her financially. And she was going to use that to be able to help establish Paul and his team in Macedonia so that they can do what? The ministry that God had called them to do. All that to say is, listen, if God has called you to something, it might seem foreign to you, but trust him because the moment you step into that, he will provide. He's Jehovah Jireh. That's what he does. He will provide for you in that moment, but also it shows that she activated her gift. And can I just say there are too many believers who are powerless because you haven't activated your gift. Too many believers. You have a spiritual gift. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, each person has received a gift. And it doesn't say to tuck it away and never use it. Oh, well, I'm just too busy. I can't use it right now. I've got this going on, and I've got this going on, this going on. And I, you know, it's just, no, 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 no. That's not what... We activate the gift because the, when you activate the gift and you begin to discover what God has put inside of you, you discover more about the person God's called you to be. And that's why we try to help people here do that very thing. We have this thing called Serve 101. It happens once a month where you can discover your gift, develop your gift, and deploy it for his kingdom. You know, church on a mission would not exist without the sacrifice of the mission team that happens. You know, first service, there's about 30 people serving. This Sunday, there's about, uh, this service right now, there's about 30 people serving. We got people investing in kids. We got people on the worship team, people on the production team, people on the welcome team, people on the safety team. I mean, people on the capture team. There's teams happen where what? People are using their gift to discover more about the person that God's called them to be. And they are what? They're activating their gift. So why? So more people can come to know Jesus. So we see that of Lydia. Lydia should inspire us today to know that if I've been saved, if I've been baptized, I need to activate the gift inside of me that God has given me so that more people can find life change just like I did. I serve because I'm redeemed. I'm served because Jesus has called me to serve. I serve because he first served. So we see this pattern with Lydia, and it's incredible how this opens up the door for ministry to begin to happen in Macedonia as Lydia becomes the provision to what God has called them to do in Macedonia. And it helps us get ready for the second story that is coming. And I'm going to just tell you guys right now, we're about, to, we're about to theologically get a lot more depth right here because this story is crazy. This story in the Bible that we're about to talk about, it's going to blow your mind a little bit. And the things that we're going to be talking about, you may have never even heard in a church service before. But over the next 30, 20, 25 minutes right now, you're going to learn how to cast a demon out. You're going to learn how to cast a demon out because that's what we're about to see right here in verse 16. Look at verse 16. It says this. Paul, it says, as we were going to the place of prayer. So in other words, Paul and his team, they took a rest. They went and rested for the night at Lydia's house. They woke up the next day, and they were ready to go evangelize to the town of Philippi. So as they go to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. And it brought her owners much gain by storytelling, fortune telling. So she had a spirit of divination. See, the, Roman, the Greco-Roman world was full of witchcraft. And a lot of us would know some of these things because of mythology. You ever heard of mythology before? So you've heard of Zeus and Poseidon and, you know, Apollo and Artemis, all these, all these little G gods. I'm just going to tell you right now, the little G gods that you think about in mythology, they're all demons. Okay? They're all demons. They're outside of the bounds of Jesus, and they're all demons. 
And by the way, we, we did this series back in October. It's on our website. You should check it out. It's called the Dark Trinity series. And we talked about the, uh, the little G God, the, the demon of Baal, and how he represents in this world today. We talked about Ashtoreth, and we talked about Moloch. And we did a deep dive, a study on those so that you could be aware of what that looks like in our world today. Because I'm going to tell you, there's Baal, Ashtoreth, and Moloch all over our society today. So go check that out, by the way. Um, But all that to say is that what we're seeing right here is we see a slave girl that has a spirit of divination. Now, what is that? What is a spirit of divination? It's very interesting, okay, because what it means is this, a spirit in which predicts the future. If you break it down into its original Greek language, it means noma pythona. Noma pythona, which means what? Python spirit. It means python spirit. All right, I, want you to, I want you to catch something, okay? Very interesting. A lot of times through the book of, of Acts or in the New Testament, when, it, when the Bible says spirit and it says noma, it usually references to an unclean spirit. Very rarely do we ever get the actual name of the spirit. But right here is one time where Luke is going to give us the actual name to the spirit. It is a python spirit. Uh, The commentator says this, a spirit, namely a python, okay? So when you read this and it says, uh, we were met by a slave girl who had a pneuma pythona, a python spirit. Now to you and I, that means nothing, (laughs) How many times have you probably, especially if you've been in church, you've read this passage or read Acts chapter 16, you just read right over it and didn't really think much about it, right? Because to you and I, it doesn't mean anything. But to Luke's time, people would have known exactly what he was talking about. So I want to give you a little context today so you can know why Luke showed us this was a Python spirit, and it goes back to the mythology. See, the story I'm about to tell you is fake, okay? Just want you to know that. But I'm going to tell you the story so you can get some of the context. All right, so you have Zeus, right? Everybody knows who Zeus is. Zeus, who was a believer in flat earth. Are there any flat earthers in here? Don't raise your hand. But (laughs) so who was a believer in flat earth, sent an eagle on each side of the, the, the earth. And so that they would fly and they would eventually what? They would meet in the middle. And where they met in the middle, they called that place Delphi, okay? And so what Zeus did is when they found the middle of the earth, they put a python there in order to protect the middle of the earth. However, the Greeks wanted to put a temple there. And so the Greeks, what they did is they sent Apollo, the god Apollo, who is the sun god, who also is known as the god who tells the future. So they sent this Apollo to slay the dragon, in other words, to go. And there was this epic battle between the python and Apollo and the python gets slayed, and he goes down uh, to the grave, and they build and construct a temple right there. Now, the priest of this temple, they would take young girls, and they would bring them in, and they would be called the Oracle of Delphi. And they would do horrible acts. You know, a lot of sexual immorality, uh, a lot of horrible things that would take place to this young girl who would be used to be demon-possessed by the god Apollo so she could predict the future for those that come to her. So what we see right here, it, it actually gets a little, a little deeper. It's interesting because on the seventh of every month, on the seventh of every month, uh, what they would do is the oracle, the young girl, would go down into the bottom, into the chamber where there were two fault lines. And the fault lines would uh, uh, would shoot some gases up, if you will, like methane gases and things like that. They believed that the python was under there, and it was the python's decaying spirit that was coming up. So what they would do is they would cap these gases, and on the seventh of every month, not every month, but on the seventh of the month, they would go in and they would undo the cap, and they would smell the gases so they could get high. It would alter their state of conscience, and they could be demonically possessed by Apollo to predict the future. So that's, I mean, there were some crazy things that were happening in, in this time and, and by the Oracle of Delphi. And, uh, <coughs> and so, um, so it alters your state of mind. This is what's happening. And, and, and you might be thinking, well, how does, that, how does that tie back to our passage? Like, what, what does that even mean for us, right? Well, it says in verse 16, right, as we're going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination 
and brought her owners much gain by fortune tellers. So in other words, what this tells us is that this woman at some point served as an oracle of Delphi at the, at the temple, and she was used to be demon-possessed so she could predict the future. Now, could she actually predict the future? Demons cannot tell the future, okay? But demons are very smart, and they get a lot of insider knowledge, and they can make it seem as if they know the future. Like, there's one story about this king who goes to the Oracle of Delphi, and uh, <laughs> he's about to be in an epic battle. And he's like, please tell me who is about to win this war. And the Oracle looked at him and says, an empire will come to an end. <laughs> of course, right? That's like, you know, LSU and Auburn about to play, and you're like, hey, the Tigers are going to win today, <laughs> you know? Because they're both Tigers? Come on, y'all can wake up a little bit. Yeah. So the idea is that they don't really tell the future. It's just smart and kind of seem like it and make it happen. So what's happening right here is just completely demonic. We have a woman who is possessed by a demon. And look, we go a lot further into this kind of stuff in the Dark Trinity series. So definitely, definitely, if you're interested in this stuff, recommend you go back to the website and go to that series and watch it through. I believe it can be set you free. It also brought me a lot of hate mail, but hey, that's, that is what it is. Anytime you call the demon out, it stirs up trouble. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, so what happens is verse 17, and we have verse 17 that happens. It says that she, the oracle of Delphi, followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So we see this part and everybody in the room's like, wait, she's demon possessed, but that sounds right. Yeah, it is right. Like, like they're, they're the servants of the Most High God who blame God for salvation. That's awesome. So what's the point? There's two things that you need to know real quick about this, okay? The first thing is this. A demon will give false hope with a little truth at first in order to gain influence over you. They're smart. So, of course, they want you on their side, so they're going to dangle a little bait in front of you, get you to believe a little bit, and eventually they're going to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy your life. So they want to bait you in. The second thing that, that's happening, and this is just what I believe, it says that she does this for several days. So I believe that as, a, as she was demonically possessed, she knew that Paul was coming with the gospel message trying to eradicate them. And she didn't want people to have, because you can know about God all you do, but if you find out about Jesus, so if she's hollering, hey, they're the servants of the most high God, hey, they're, she's, in other words, she's distracting away from Paul being able to do his job. So Paul was needing to minister. And so finally, Paul is going to react. It says in verse 18, and this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed. Okay, this doesn't mean the way that we think about it, right? Obviously, I feel like we should be. Would you be annoyed at something like that? Be ready to throat punch her or something, you know? Um, but, but that's not happening. When you actually break this down into its original language, what it means is that Paul actually begins to have compassion for her. He begins to see, he, he starts to notice something's not right. She's, she's got a demon in her. She needs to be delivered. He starts to care for her as, at a personal level. And so he stops what he's doing. He turns and says to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, set this woman free from demonic possession. It's a great story. And there's a lot that we can learn from it, a lot that we can know about it. See, one thing you have to understand is that the supernatural world is real. It's very real. Some of us don't really think about it like that, but it is a very real thing. And there's, there's two types of conditions when it comes to demonic influence. There's demonic possession and there's demonic oppression. See, demonic possession can happen to unbelievers, people who don't know Jesus. You can open up the door spiritually through some kind of way, usually some kind of sinful way, and a demon can possess you. I don't believe that believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit can be possessed, but you can be oppressed, which means that maybe you have some type of sin in your life that you're dealing with, you've given the devil a foothold over you, and... It's a stronghold in your life, demonic influence that has stopped you from being able to be effective for the kingdom of God. And let me tell you something. Both of these conditions require deliverance. 
both of them. All right, and I want to be clear today. At Church on a Mission, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? We are a spirit-filled church. Can I get an amen? amen? We are a spirit-filled church. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, which means this. Catch me, all right? We believe that every person filled with the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, can cast demons out. Amen. Does not have to be a pastor, and you don't have to call your priest. Amen. Why? Because Jesus has given you the authority to do that. Amen. He's given you the power through the Holy Spirit to do that very thing. Paul, with the proper training and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, casted that sad sucker out. You can do the same. Let's go to the Bible. Mark chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. It says that Jesus appointed 12, designated them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to what? Drive out demons. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 through 8, it says, As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I'm, not, I'm telling you, Revival Nights, we're believing that right there. People set free, delivered and set free in the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 says, These signs will accompany those who what? Believe. Those who what? Read it. Believe. Those who believe in my name, they will drive out demons. In my name. You have the authority. Let me tell you something. Deliverance is a part of any gospel ministry. Yes, there are some weird deliverance ministries out there, and you have to be careful especially with doctrine and things like that. You can get caught up in some weird stuff that's not even biblical. But deliverance should be a part of every gospel ministry. I'm tired of the days, y'all, of going to a church and finding five ways I can be stress-free, three ways to have a pure heart. You know, I'm tired of the topical stuff. It's time that we get down into what the Bible is telling us to do, stand firm on the truth, and fight back against the world because all that's producing is ignorant Christians Amen. that don't know how to fight back. Amen. Come on, may we be a church, an army of Jesus influencers, Amen. ready to take the authority that Jesus has given us. Amen. Because there's an increase in demonic activity in our world today. Let me tell you something, church. For a person to walk into a school and shoot it up, for a person to walk into any store, any place, and shoot people up, that's demonic possession. Yes. 100%. The rise of mental health that we see today in our Gen Zers and our Gen Alphas, even in our Millennials, and I'm going to leave you boomers out. The rise in mental health. Gen X, here we go. Mental health, it's demonic. At the core, it's demonic. And I'm not just saying it because I see it. It's statistically proven there's more kids trying to commit suicide than ever before. There's more kids dealing with mental problems than ever before. It's skyrocketing, especially when you're trying to tell them what gender they are. Yes. Yes. The reality is today is that we've got, to, we've got to stand firm on the truth of God. I mean, there's this rise in the world that's coming against the moral standards that the Bible gives us. They're coming after traditional marriage. They're coming after abortion. They're coming after things to try to say, hey, this stuff is right. This stuff, come on, somebody. We've got to stand firm on the truth of God's word and say enough is enough. That's demonic influence in our world today. And now I'm not saying we're going to hate unbelievers. Disagreement is not discrimination. We got, but we can't love them to hell. We got to love them to truth. We got to be Jesus for them and not look like the world outside these walls. There's a growing thing of demonic influence. So what I want to do to wrap up our time today is give you eight steps on how to deliver someone, how to cast a demon out. I pray that you take some notes right here, because you never know when you might get put in a situation where you can do this yourself, because what you can't. Two things, two things I want to tell you, though, okay, before we kind of jump into this, I'm going to have to go through it quick, because I'm running out of time already, uh, and I'm going to go through these quick, by the way. The first thing is this, okay? Don't be scared of demons. Don't be scared. There's nothing to be scared about, okay? You have the authority. The supernatural world is real. Understand that, and take the authority that Jesus has given you. The second thing is, for those who are going to do the deliverance, make sure that you yourself are delivered. You know, you need to hear that, okay? Catch that. 
If you're going to do some deliverance to somebody, like you saying, my crazy aunt, she needs to be delivered in Jesus' name, okay? Make sure you deliver first. Why? Because the Bible is very clear that if a demon gets delivered out, it will jump to another person. And if you're not in a healthy place, it could jump straight and call stronghold in your life as well. We're going to see that in Acts chapter 19 and a few, few, few chapters away. It's funny because these Jewish rabbis, they see Paul casting out some demons and they're like, <laughs> they're all like, yo, we want to do what you do. So they go to these people that are demonically possessed and, and, uh, and they look, the demons look at this, these rabbis and they're like, listen, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but we don't know who you are. And then they jump on them and beat them up. <laughs> Okay, so you got to be ready to understand that you yourself need to be delivered before you try any of these eight steps. Eight steps for you. Number one is this. Remember the individual who is demonized is a person. Remember that the, the individual who is demonized is a person. They're not a project. They're not a demon. They are a person whom Jesus loves. Too many of us are getting our theology of the demonic realm from Hollywood. And let me tell you something, Hollywood, because we all watch the scary movies, I know you do, right? Hollywood takes the humanity out of people, and then they make deliverance a performance. And that's not what it is at all. Very rare, I don't know if you'd ever really see a true deliverance happening with a whole bunch of shouting, right? In Hollywood, they start beating the person, with a whack, smacking him, throwing him up against the wall, and next thing you know, the demon's like, it's fighting, it's all this stuff, it's craziness, right? That's just performance, that's not what deliverance is. All right, so don't get your theology of what exorcisms or anything like that looks like from Hollywood. Always look at God's word. Shouting doesn't give you more power. Amen. All right? Pablo Batari, he says this in his book, Free in Christ. Deliverance is not about shouting. It is focused on discovering what it is that is giving the enemy authority to remain. So deliverance is not a performance. It is a journey of discovery to help the person be set free the person who Jesus loves. So before you even start the process, make sure your mindset's right. That person's a human being that Jesus loves. The second step is this. Once you've done that, and these aren't just eight principles. These are in order steps, okay? So step two, take authority over the demonic spirit. We just read a few verses that says what? Jesus has given you the authority to cast demons out. You take the authority that Jesus has given you. This is where you start. He, we need to be spirit-filled warriors. Don't be scared of these demons. Take authority. Quick story that actually happened to me a few weeks ago. I knew that as our ministry began to, to grow and see a lot of life change, something eventually was going to start to come against me or my wife or our family. And it was crazy. The week after we baptized 16 people, I had to go on a work trip. And as I'm on my work trip, I'm in Pensacola in a hotel uh, by myself, and I go to bed, and I had a dream. And I'm telling you guys this, 100% true. I'm not lying to you. This actually happened to me just like three weeks ago. So I am, I'm sleeping. I have a dream. In the dream, I had a voodoo witch is in front of me with like a dog and doing something to it while they're, cat, they're saying something over me, all right? So I'm, I'm having this, 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 this dream. And when, and when she starts to cast the spells on me, all of a sudden I had ants and like ticks and like insects crawling up my arms and my, my legs. And I was just like, and they started to bite me. And it was crazy. I could feel it, right? It gets even crazier because when I started to feel the bites, I woke up. And when I woke up, y'all, I'm not even kidding you. I could still, I couldn't see them, but I could still feel the ants and the ticks and the insects on my legs and my feet biting me. And I'm just like, what is going on? And I start scratching. All of a sudden, I could just feel this demonic presence in my hotel room. I just felt it laying over me. And I, I was just like, you know, for a moment there, def definitely had some fear, right? You know, and, and I definitely, you know, did this a lot different than I did seven years ago. Because seven years ago, I had a very similar dream, except I didn't have the physical sensation like I did. But they had a witch that was casting spells. And I had the dream over and over again, like eight nights in a row. And I was scared to death, y'all. Like, I was the kind of person that I went on this, you know, a few years ago, I went on this, uh, this evangelism trip down into the French Quarter, and I started talking to this guy, and I realized he was probably possessed, and I was like, listen, man, I want to just talk to you about Jesus, and he looks at me, he's like, we are legion, and I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, right. That was before I was brave, y'all, you know? 
<laughs> I hope he does that to me today. You know, but but so anyways, I'm 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 in the I'm in the room and I'm like and I, I feel the person. I obviously have a little fear, but then all of a sudden I just I sat up in my bed and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave right now. You have no authority to be here. And then I just started praying in the spirit. Shut up, you know, right there at three o'clock in the morning. And let me tell you something. Within about a minute. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I didn't feel nothing in my arms or legs. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I have the authority over that. Amen. The demons have to, have to leave. They have to listen. Matter of fact, Jesus, he sent out 72 people to do ministry. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, it says, When the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Amen. They even recognized it. Wow, there's power in the name of Jesus. Some of you are thinking, what are some of the signs of someone who is demonically possessed, though? How can you know? A lot of times I tell people, you, you, you know. Like you can, especially if you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, you start to kind of really experience and feel that. But here's a few of them. Uh, you'll notice that somebody has a loss of control of their movements or sudden movements. Um, they have a disfigured face. Their face begins to change. They maybe have humiliating behavior. I'm just going to tell you, sometimes when you're going down the street and you see somebody who's walking down the street and they're talking to themselves and they're doing all this, you're like, Leah showed me a TikTok the other day and this, this chick was like taking a bath in the mud and all the police officers were just watching her. You know, like, it's sad. She's demonically possessed. That's what's making it. It's probably substance abuse that altered her conscience of mind, just like the Oracle of Delphi, allowed the, the, the devil to come in, the demon to come in and possess. <laughs> Self-harm. Somebody who wants to commit self-harm to themselves. Um, somebody whose eyes change or hostile or glassy look. Somebody who has difficulty opening their eyes or eyes roll back in their head. Um, a pain in the chest or other parts of the body. I'm going to stop right here and tell you this too. And I got a lot of hate mail last time I said this. And I'm just going to say it again. And my, my email, by the way, is ryan at churchonamission.org. Okay? But let me tell you something, okay? There are some people, and not everybody, not all the time. There are some people you're believing for healing in your body because you have some type of pain. And you think that you need to be healed by his stripes, but in reality, it's a demon that's inducing the pain on you. There's multiple times in the Bible where we see somebody who had pain because of a demonic influence. We see a woman who was crippled. Why? Because of demon, a demon possession. We see a man who was mute. Why? Because of a demonic possession. So you may be here today, and you may have some type of sickness or pain that you've been believing for healing for, and you're like, I don't understand what's going on. It's because there's a demon attached in some kind of way, and you need deliverance. That's what you need. And that's what's going to heal you and set you free. I'll, it, it, really, if you, want, if you want to know, I just don't have time today. I'll, I'll send you multiple verses from the Bible um, of, of that. Another thing is that maybe they have a nervous or sarcastic laughter. One is supernatural strength, um, profane speech, or isolation. So a lot of these are, are indications that a person is demonically possessed. And I'm going to tell you one last thing on this point. Listen, don't talk to the demon. Right. When you're sitting down with somebody to deliver them, don't talk to the demon. Don't entertain them. They're just liars. Right. We had a guy about two years ago came to our church. After about three weeks, we started catching on. You know, me and, and Leah, Leah was like, really, man, hey, we're discerning something right here. Something's off about this guy. Especially when he started messaging me, Leah's like, yo, that guy is probably possessed. Like something's going on. We started really to noticing something about, um, about him. And he decided he wanted to meet with us after church. So I was like, yo, Pastor Sam, would you mind meeting with me with this guy? And I'm just going to say his name was Tyler because I'm not going to give you his real name. Um, but he said his name was, you know, hey, I'm Tyler. I want to talk after church. Can we do that? So as we sit down to talk with him, he starts telling us that he, has this impart, he needs to impart divine knowledge to us that's been given to him from celestial beings. All right? We find out that he's from a satanic occult and that he was actually like writing people's names down in a book that he was learning at the church. There was a lot of things that were happening. And so as we start to try to talk to him, you could, you could literally see when the demon was talking and when Tyler was talking. Like Pastor Sam, I was so cool watching him do this, but there's times where the demon would start talking to Pastor Sam and be like, listen, I'm not talking to you right now. I want to talk to Tyler. Let me talk to Tyler. In the name of Jesus, say, you let me talk to Tyler. And then Tyler would come back for a second, you know. And then we started, like, and, and unfortunately, we couldn't get Tyler. He had um, binders of this knowledge that he'd been given that he wanted to give to the church and tell all the church. And he wouldn't go and burn that. He didn't want deliverance. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
But what we could see is, listen, you don't have to talk to the demons. Don't entertain the demons, nothing like that. They're liars, not worth your time. Number three is you got to do this. So you got to find out if the person wants deliverance. Step three, does the person want deliverance in the first place? And listen to me, if they don't want it, leave them. Don't try. You might be thinking, really, Pastor? Why not? Well, Luke chapter 11, verse 24 says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. So in other words, you can cast this demon out, but the demon's just going to go back. Amen. The person doesn't truly want, and it'll come back even worse. There was a story my pastor told me, and I know he's not lying about this story. This is crazy. Uh, another crazy you know, demon possession story. But one day he got a phone call from this, this lady, and she says, Pastor, I need help. I have a, um, I have a, my son. He is demonically possessed, and I need, I need help. I need him to be delivered. And so he asked her a few questions, and come to find out, the, the kid, he was basically chained at the bottom of their basement because anytime he was let loose, he would run around outside naked. He would try to kill people. Um, he had taken, he was a 90 pound kid. And he had picked up a 230-pound football coach and threw him and broke the guys both his legs. All right, so they had chained him. They had a belt around. So the pastor said when he got to the basement, they had a, a belt around this kid, and he was chained to the wall. And um, and he says, "All right." So we we're looking at the situation, and <laughs> he said something funny to me too when he was when he was telling the story. He says, uh, "You know, I told the guy what sent me. Hey, we're gonna go lay hands on him." And the guy looked at me like, "We're gonna lay hands on him." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to lay hands on him. So they get some anointing oil, and they go and lay hands on him. And, and the pastor, he said he, they casted about six demons out of this, this boy. And after they did that, the kid kind of fell limp. He wasn't doing nothing. You know? And so he, he looked at the mom. He says, listen, you can unchain him. He's, he's been set free. So they unchained him. The boy got up. He went to the bathroom. When he came out of the bathroom, he looked at the pastor and says, I don't know why you did that. The moment you leave, I'm going to invite them to come back. And pastor looked at him and says, why in the world would you do such a thing? What kind of life is this? He's like, I don't care. I like the power that they give me. I said, but the power of Jesus just sets you free. He says, I don't care. I like the power that they give me. And the pastor said, before he could walk up the stairs, that kid was singing to the demons again, inviting them back. He ends up getting possessed again. They have to send him to an institution a few weeks later, and he commits suicide. See, the reality is there's some people out there that don't want to be delivered. So as you're going through this process of deliverance with somebody, you need to understand, hey, do you want deliverance in the first place? And if they say yes, I do want to be delivered, you move to step four, lead the person to Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, you can, and 9 and 10, you can write that down, right? That, that right there, you, can, you, you write that down, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart and you're saved. You're going to lead them to confessing with their mouth and surrendering their life to Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can now seal their life and protect them from demonic possession. The fifth thing you're going to do, and worship team, you guys can come on up, you're going to discover areas of sin that are present that have led to bondage. All right? Listen, demonic influence happens through sin. Sin opens the door for possession or oppression. All right? So I'm going to give you a few examples, because remember, deliverance is not a performance. It's a discovery it's a journey of discovery, right? So when you're talking to this person, you don't just need to pray for Jesus to, to save them, but you need to find the root of whatever sin is causing that fruit in their life. And here's a few of them that it could be. It could be hate. I mean, hate's what leads somebody to walk into a school and bust people up, right? It could be fear over your life, some type of fear that you feel. It could be unforgiveness, rejection, and resentment. See, these are emotions, they give the devil a foothold on you. They're not godly. And then he can try to control you because of these. There's occult practices. I'm going to tell you something today, okay? Tarot card readers, palm readers, psychics, astrology, crystals, anything outside the bound of Jesus is demonic. Okay? You need to know that. There is no such thing as good witchcraft. And any time you go to do something like that, you open the door for either possession or oppression in your life. But pastor, it seems so good. Absolutely. Didn't the slave girl seem so good? These are the servants of the most high God. Because the demon wants to give you a little bit of truth in order to what? 
trap you. Ultimately, to steal, kill, and destroy your life. So you have to understand, look, there's some of you I know because it's a growing practice. Witchcraft is exploding in our country today. I mean, there's so many TikToks that are teaching our kids how to do it. Even on KidsTube, y'all. You got to be careful what your kids are watching and be mindful of that. Because like that, the enemy's trying to catch a stronghold on them. Same thing with you. Listen, what, what do you need to do if you've been dealing with that stuff? Whatever you have, go burn it today. Let it out of your house. Just like we were talk, talking with Tyler and he had that book, he wasn't willing to go put that book in the fire. You got to be willing to get separate yourself from it. There's hypnotism. There's illicit sexual relationships and activity. Listen, sex outside the bounds of marriage opens up the door for possession and oppression in your life when you do that. And there's too many people that want to talk about how you need to have a high body count nowadays. I mean, let's just be real, right? That's not going to set you free. That's not going to bring you love. That's not going to bring you fulfillment. It's a trap by the enemy. So you need to separate yourself from that. There's abortion. And some of you might be thinking, wait, why would you put abortion up there? You're saying people that are committed abortion are demonically possessed. That's not what I'm saying. I want you to hear me on this, okay? When you commit abortion, which is a sin, if the baby is killed, it is statistically proven that you will have shame, guilt, and regret almost immediately. And so the enemy now uses those three things to try to control your life. Oppression. So if you're here today, because there's a very good chance there's somebody in this room today that has committed abortion, and you struggle with the guilt and the shame and the regret, can I tell you today, that's why Jesus went to the cross to die for you. You are forgiven in Jesus' name are forgiven. Yes, it was a mistake, but that doesn't wreck your future because God never wastes his pain. He always turns it into purpose. Let it be a testimony in your life and don't allow the enemy to have stronghold over you. And then there's substance abuse. I'm going to tell you something else. Y'all, marijuana will open up the door for you to be demonically possessed or oppressed. Why? Because it alters the state of your conscience. Anything you do to alter the state of your conscience opens up the door to the spiritual realm for you to be possessed or oppressed. So smoking marijuana does the same thing as getting drunk. Because you can get drunk and it starts to do that. Why do you think we have so many things that happen when people are drunk, right? Because spirits can now entertain that and try to make something happen. Same thing when somebody's high or just having a substance abuse. Why do you think the Oracle of Delphi, they would smell the gases in order to alter the state of conscience so they could be possessed? All right. So these are the type of things. Look, when you're going through deliverance with somebody, you need to figure out where's the root. What's the root that's causing the issue in their life? And you need to begin to pray over it. But then what you're going to do is you're going to do step number six. You're going to renounce the causes of the demonic activity. The power of life and death are in the tongue. So you need to have the person begin to renounce whatever it is that they are facing. And this is interesting. Sometimes you'll hear it. People have a hard time that are demonically possessed or oppressed have a hard time saying the name Jesus. They won't even be able to hardly get it out. You just keep praying and rebuking that spirit and allow them. They themselves need to say it. Make sure they say it. Make sure they renounce whatever it is. And once they've renounced the cause of the demonic activity, well, number seven, you cast that sap sucker out. In the name of Jesus, be set free. And after you've casted that evil spirit out, number eight, you invite the Holy Spirit to begin to fill the places that were occupied by the evil spirit. Because remember, he wants to leave and he wants to come back. That ain't happening. So we're just going to begin to pray that the Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, begin to fill this person up to overflow. All this to say is that the supernatural world, it's real. But we don't have to be afraid of demons because we have authority over it. Let me tell you something. There might be some people here today. I believe that Jesus can set you free right here, right now. 
I believe that you can leave here with a weight lifted as you give your heart to Jesus. Maybe that's what it is. Or you lay down the things that are sinful in your life at the foot of the cross. And listen, if you're dealing with something that's pretty, pretty heavy, the altar might not be a good place to start because usually we only do five or ten minutes right here. Maybe you need to call and schedule something with me and Pastor Sam and we'll go through a journey of discovery to help you see deliverance and find deliverance in your life. But at the end of the day, what I want you to know, and everybody you can get ready to stand on your feet as we get ready to respond today. What I want you to know is this. Do not be scared of a demon. Please know that the authority has been given to you as a spirit-filled believer, as a spirit-filled warrior, that nothing can stand against you, right? That's what Romans tells us. For my God is for me, there is nothing that can stand against me. So I need you to know right now, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus told us this, you dear children are, for, are from God and have overcome the evil spirit because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in and in the world. Can I tell you today, you serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You serve King Jesus and if there's anything that comes against you, you have his authority. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit been given to you. Every head bowed and eyes closed prayer team, you can come on forward right now. That's what I'm believing right now. I'm believing there may be some people in the room right now. You need a touch from heaven. You need Jesus right now to set you free. Maybe you're here today and you're sick. James chapter 5 says, are anyone among you sick? You call on the elders of the church and a prayer offer, and you'll anoint them with oil and a prayer offering and faith will heal the sick. See, I believe right here in this moment for the next, say, five, ten minutes, you are going to find freedom, healing through Jesus. That's what I'm believing right now. So as we begin to play in just a moment, I encourage you to come forward. Even if you don't want to be, maybe you just want to lay down at the feet of Jesus right now at the altar. Say, Lord, I give it to you right now. I believe God can do something powerful over the next few minutes. God, we just give you these next few minutes right now. We allow you, Holy Spirit, to do what only you can do and begin to work. Lord, I just pray right now over every person that might be finding demonic oppression in their life. Jesus, I pray, Lord, right now I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I declare that the hate would be gone, that the fear would be gone, that the unforgiveness would be gone, that the rejection or the resentment would be gone. I declare in the name of Jesus, you would reveal the occult practices that we need to burn and throw away today when we leave these doors. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that the guilt, the shame, and the things that we feel would be gone, the depression, the anxiety would be gone in the name of Jesus, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lord, we declare freedom right now to reign in this place. In Jesus' name, come on. If you need prayer, you come on down. If you need some altar time, come on down. But take this moment to just begin to let the Holy Spirit speak to you.